Okay. It's going to inhibit, when the optic nerve is active, it inhibits the release of melatonin. Melatonin comes out at night. So some people call the, drac the, the pineal gland the Dracula gland because it's more active in the dark. So when, when the optic nerve is open, it, um, it inhibits, it turns off the melatonin. Okay. Right, the optic nerve is going to be, when the optic nerve is active, when your eyes are open, when it's light, etc., you don't want to feel sleepy. So your melatonin levels are down. If you want to improve your sleep conditions, that's, I'm sure most people have read now that one of the problems with people who can't sleep is because they're on their cell phone or on their computer until the last minute. That light is perfect for stimulating the optic nerve, which is going to inhibit your melatonin. If you want your kid to go to sleep, make sure the lights are all out. It's very dark kind of thing. Don't have any optic nerve stimulus. And of course, then just the opposite happens when you get shifted to night duty. Mm -hmm. kind of thing, and you have to deal with that whole sense of, I really should be doing something other than what I'm doing, like saving people's lives. So, optic nerve is going to, now in humans, that's what we can document, that the hypothalamus's wake sleep cycle is affected. In animals, there's very strong evidence that it also affects their mm -hmm. reproductive cycles. We all know that most mammals, at least, are are cycles so that they'll have their offspring in the very beginning of the spring so that they have a maximum time for development. And again, melatonin seems to be released based on a, an annual cycle of longer days and shorter days. But for people, we're just going to worry about melatonin, wake sleep cycle, etc. If we go to the other end of the hypothalamus, here's my hypothalamus. If we go to the other end of the hypothalamus, remember we have an infundibulum stalk, and the infundibulum has the pituitary gland, which we're going to separate out into an anterior pituitary and a posterior pituitary. Remember your posterior pituitary, we said was also called the neuro hypothesis. because the posterior pituitary is simply an extension of the brain tissue, its nerve tissue. It does not make any of its own hormones, but it <coughs> takes hormones that are produced in the hypothalamus and sends them down and releases them from the posterior pituitary. We might as well talk about those first. I almost used somebody's cell phone as an eraser when I'm doing things. <laughs> so we'll talk about two hormones that come out of the posterior pituitary. They're secreted by the posterior pituitary, but they're going to be produced by the hypothalamus. And one is going to be oxytocin. Oxytocin is a protein, comes from the hypothalamus via the posterior pituitary. Does everybody understand the hieroglyphics? Okay. Oxytocin is going to have two primary targets that we know of, at least for our purposes. Oxytocin's job is to go to the uterus, and cause labor contractions. Oxytocin is going to go to the smooth muscles around the uterus and cause labor contractions. Now what's interesting is that if we look at a uterus, and somebody described it as sort of an upside down pear, the stretch receptors, the pressure receptors lining the uterus are mostly in the cervical area. There's very few stretch receptors up here. But when the baby is large enough to start to stimulate these stretch receptors, the stretch receptors will move up the spinal cord to the hypothalamus and tell the hypothalamus it's time to release oxytocin. Look what happens. We start to contract the uterus and we push the baby down into an area where there's more stretch receptors so that the message to contract 
gets even stronger. As we move into the cervical area, we get more and more oxytocin, more and more labor contractions. The stress receptors are what go up to the hypothalamus? The, their nerve endings will go up the spinal cord. So what we have here is a positive feedback. A little bit of oxytocin gives us a little bit of a little bit of stretch gives us a little oxytocin, more stretch, more oxytocin, more stretch, more oxytocin, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of being a corrective action, we have an exacerbating and enlarging and increasing reaction, positive feedback. Physiologists get very excited about it. In the second place, though, that we see oxytocin, it's second target. One target, one action. The second target is the milk glands in the breast. And be careful because what oxytocin does is it, it stimulates, again, muscles. He's not going to make milk. He doesn't stimulate milk glands. What he stimulates is the muscles in the ducts of the milk glands to cause the milk to come to the surface. So we say that it's milk expression. It's not the milk production. We have other hormones that are going to make milk production, but this is the one that delivers the milk to the surface. Again, the hypothalamus is going to listen to pressure receptors. Pressure receptors in the breast are going to report to the hypothalamus. When a baby is born, when a baby is born, the one reflex it has to have is that if you touch his lips, his lips are going to start sucking. So that when you take that newborn and you put it to the breast, the mother is not secreting milk. She's not expressing milk until the physical stimulus of a baby going to the breast starts. Once that pressure starts on the milk glands, the hypothalamus will then send down oxytocin and you will have milk expression. So basically the baby's learning to feed himself. The baby has to start the cycle. And we can continue that cycle. We can continue that cycle. If anyone knows, remember, I don't know that they do it anymore. They probably do, just don't talk about it. There are women who are called wet nurses. And these are women who just continue to lactate, continue that oxytocin cycle simply because they're continuing to nurse somebody's child. Kind of thing. <laughs> now, interestingly enough, so oxytocin is a hormone that's stimulated what? Neurohormonal humoral. <coughs> Which are we going to use? Yeah, I got one neural. Anybody else? The question is, which of the three types of stimulation is going to cause oxytocin release? Humoral, neural, or hormonal? Don't give it up, Avalon. You're right. It's neural. <laughs> I would like to. I have a double. No, no. You're good. Look at the, as soon as you see the word receptors, nerve endings are what's going to report the condition. Nerves are what goes up to the hypothalamus and tells it to produce oxytocin. So oxytocin is always released with a neural stimulation. Now there's a third very interesting thing that's coming up, but again it lands us into the field of psychology. Oxytocin we find is released in both, this is only in females because clinically speaking that's where we're probably going to take it. But we know that oxytocin is released in both males and females somewhere around orgasm time because it's a comfort. It's a relationship creating, it's a bonding hormone that we find. We find that when you're with someone that you feel comfortable with, oxytocin levels rise. I said, don't listen. There was a great article just last year released that when you stare at a dog and the dog stares back at you kind of thing, and you draw blood from both you and the animal, oxytocin levels go up kind of thing because, oh, the dog loves me, oh, I love my dog, et cetera, et cetera. They, I'm not sure how they got the blood out of the dog, but we won't discuss that kind of thing. But then they did the same experiment with a person staring at a wolf. And the person may have loved the wolf and said, oh, what a cute little puppy. The wolf's blood levels of oxytocin didn't go up. <laughs> kind of thing. So oxytocin, we know it seems to have some sort of a bonding effect. We know that oxytocin 
the production of oxytocin helps mom and child bond. We know that oxytocin between couples, blood levels go up. So there's some sort of psychological factor that oxytocin is doing. We're just going to worry about this one, okay, because this is clinically what we can document. The other hormone coming out of the hypothalamus via the posterior pituitary is going to be ADH or anti-diuretic hormone. And again, we can use the clinical abbreviation. I might even ask you what, what the clinical what hormone is if I say ADH. But ADH pretty much tells us where he's going to go. His target is going to be the kidneys. And his action is going to be to decrease urine output which means we're retaining water. If you ever forget, ADH is sometimes used for kids that are bedwetters. It helps them retain their urine longer. Because I sometimes forget directions. ADH's job is to reduce urine output, retain water. OK, question. If I retain water, what happens to my blood volume? What happens to my blood pressure? ADH affects blood pressure. Second hormone to affect blood pressure. Remember the first one was aldosterone, but he does it a different way. He does it by saving sodium. This guy does it by just simply saving water. So if we retain water, we increase blood volume. And if we increase blood volume, we increase blood pressure. What causes the hypothalamus to do this? Interestingly enough, how would you like to move? <laughs> Maybe another day. <laughs> the hypothalamus has a series of nerve endings in the hypothalamus itself. Osmoreceptors. Osmoreceptors measure dehydration. They measure the viscosity of the blood. When your blood starts to thicken, we say you're dehydrating. Osmoreceptors are going to measure dehydration. This is in the hypothalamus? Yes. The problem with dehydration is critical because when you dehydrate, what's happening to your blood pressure? It's going to drop. And remember, the kidneys are very sensitive to, de to drop in blood pressure. They're going to shut down. Your heart will drop. Well, if there's a drop in blood pressure, the heart decides it's not going to work either. So dehydration is a very serious physiological condition. And we're going to do three things. When the brain senses you're dehydrated, how does it know? It's measuring the osmolarity of the blood. Remember from AMP1, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to feel thirsty. Remember the hypothalamus was the center of hunger and satiety and thirst and all those other places. So as soon as those osmoreceptors fire, you're going to feel thirsty and you're going to take action to try to replace that. Second thing we're going to do is we're going to release ADH. And, it, and ADH is going to go down to the kidneys and start to retain water. But both of those things take time. is going to be released, but both the release, the action of ADH, retaining water in the kidneys, the action of drinking and replacing body fluid volume, takes time. It takes minutes. It takes hours. And if you're seriously dehydrating, you don't have time for that. Yeah. Oh, what is ADH? Antidiuretic? Okay. So one of the things that happens, so ADH is going to go, we know it goes to the kidneys and tells you to retain water. ADH has another name. ADH is also called vasopressin because as ADH travels through the bloodstream, 
It causes vasoconstriction. It causes vasoconstriction, as in pressing on the vasos, vasopressing. And what's that going to do to your blood pressure? <coughs> it's going to go up. When you squeeze a blood vessel, the blood pressure goes up. So we have an immediate. If you're dehydrated, your body's in trouble. Your kidneys want to shut down, and your heart's thinking about it too. So immediately we constrict blood vessels and at least temporarily get the blood pressure up. In the meantime, we'll retain urine to keep get the fluids back up, and we'll drink more fluids. So but that's the initial vessel to be That's going to be the fastest reaction. Because we don't have time. If you're dehydrating, it's physiologically serious. So we have to immediately vasopress, and then that buys us the time to go drink something to have ADH work on the kidneys. Yeah? So no matter what, if your blood vessels are getting like vasoconstricted, like vasoconstriction, your blood vessels, your blood pressure will rise? Yep. Why? Why? Yeah. Because like, there's like two workouts in the tree, and they say like, it causes vasoconstriction, but doesn't rise, increase your blood pressure. Does huh. that make any sense? I wonder if that's because you're doing the physical activity at the same time? Yeah, like, I mean, you're causing blood pressure to rise anyway. Well, it's in, we'll have to talk about, we'll have to think about that, but I think what's happening also, as long as you're doing physical activity, your heart is working and, and affecting blood pressure also. But that would be interesting. And a non-athletic person. <laughs> but, that's, but in general, vasoconstriction. Now, it may be that it's not vasoconstriction in, say, skeletal muscles or something. Well, it's actually like an ingredient in some of the pre workouts. Oh, okay. So they would rise tone up. But that's what I looked it up. It said it causes vasoconstriction, constriction, but doesn't increase blood pressure. That makes sense. We'll have to go find out about that one. <coughs> okay, so a second hormone coming out of the hypothalamus that's coming out through the posterior pituitary is ADH. ADH simply has kidneys as a target, and we're going to retain fluid and affect blood pressure. Remember, though, the kid, that ADH is also called vasopressin. So if I ask on an exam, what's another name for ADH? Please don't tell me antidiuretic hormone. That's the same name. What's the other one? Vasopressin. So the second target we could say for ADH is blood vessels, and it causes vasoconstriction. Good? Now, anterior pituitary is going to give us a bit of a problem. Because the anterior pituitary produces six of its own protein hormones, but every single one of them is controlled by the hypothalamus. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the hormones that come out of the hypothalamus, and we're going to talk about the hormones that come out of the anterior pituitary, all in one chart. And let's see if we can follow that. We know that there's six hormones coming in the, out of the anterior pituitary. Let's just arbitrarily pick prolactin as the first hormone. We see the lacto in there, so we know what he does. Prolactin's target is going to be the breast glands, and he's going to tell them to produce milk. Not express it, but simply enlarge the, the storage of milk. Prolactin's target is to go to the breast and simply make the milk, and then you have to have a secondary effect of oxytocin to express it. <coughs> if anyone ever has ever studied <coughs> lactation, we've got any lactation specialists, also known as Nazis here? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're passionate. Let's put that up. Kind of thing. Anyway, prolactin is going to be released from the anterior pituitary when a hormone called prolactin <coughs> releasing hormone or PRH. PRH is released from the hypothalamus. Its target is the anterior pituitary and its action is to tell the anterior pituitary to release prolactin. So I've, on the board I've got two hormones, two pathways now. Prolactin's target breast action. Prolactin releasing hormones target is anterior pituitary. Action is to make prolactin. 
So we have to ask again, what's the stimulus for this? And the stimulus to tell the hypothalamus to produce PRH is when you have elevated estrogen. When there are very elevated levels of progesterone, of estrogen. And that's usually when you have a placenta, which means you're pregnant. Okay? That's when we're going to want to have milk production. Only when you have super elevated. Now, some women are just lucky enough in a regular menstrual cycle to produce enough estrogen that their breasts start to enlarge. But normally, we re reserve that action for during the pregnancy. Most of the time, we're not producing prolactin. We're not producing breast milk. And that's because there's a second hormone. Prolactin inhibiting hormone. Prolactin inhibiting hormone is going to do exactly what it says. He's going to tell the anterior pituitary not to produce prolactin. Target anterior pituitary action is to turn off prolactin production. Yeah? yeah. That's what it is for the hypothalamus, right? The guys under here are under hypothalamus. The guys over here are going to be anterior it's pituitary. It's what it not release. Right, it inhibits. So which one produces the prolactin? Prolactin releasing hormone is going to tell the anterior pituitary to make prolactin. Prolactin inhibiting is going to tell the anterior pituitary to turn it off. So it's to make it or to release it? Sorry. All of the above. Okay. Sorry. Okay. In this case, we can simply say normal levels of estrogen. Okay. So again, we know prolactin best in women because clinically that's where we're going to deal with it. We know that prolactin is produced by males. We're just not clear what it's doing. And the normal levels is just the cause for it to do that? That's the stimulus that causes PIH to be produced. Right. So in the adult female, she's, not, she's normally producing <coughs> PIH. And so we're running around with our foot on the prolactin break. So we have, one of us is going to end up in a bad situation. So we have two hormones coming out of the hypothalamus. We've got one hormone coming out of the anterior pituitary. Prolactin is controlled by releasing an inhibiting hormone, a gas pedal and a brake pedal second hormone coming out that also growth hormone coming out of the anterior pituitary growth hormones target is going to be all body cells and it's going to tell the cells to grow how do cells grow they don't get bigger when we talk about cells growing what do they do when tissue grows, what does it do? It mitosis. Okay, mitosis. So that's what growth hormone is doing. It's stimulating mitosis. Cell division. That's cell growth, just like in micro. Bacteria don't get bigger, <coughs> they divide. Okay? Now if we're going to ask cells to divide, we better feed them. So what we're going to do also is we're going to increase blood nutrient levels. Specifically, we're going to release, we're going to break down fats into fatty acids. We're going to increase the amount of blood glucose. In other words, we're getting food into the bloodstream so that these dividing cells have something to eat. But another thing growth hormone does is it increases protein synthesis. It takes amino acids and it builds proteins. Looking at those three actions, can you see why if you stay up very late at night and watch these really gruesome advertisements on television where these very old wrinkled men from California in bathing suits two sizes too small will advertise that
that you should take growth hormone as a rejuvenating hormone because it helps you lose weight. We're breaking down our fats. It helps you to build muscle or anything like that. I've just noticed that lately there's something else being advertised by a beauty expert. Can you imagine somebody having the nerve to get in front of a television and say, I'm a beauty expert kind of thing. I just, I, I lose her at that point. But it's basically something that stimulates growth hormone in women. And it really bothers me that we're doing that because you realize that when we send out growth hormone into the body, it may do those things, but it may also stimulate the growth and mitosis of latent cancers and of other disease pathogens that are in, latent in the body that may not be causing you any problems. Be very, very careful with growth hormone. Everybody likes to talk about it as a rejuvenating, as a youth. It, 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 it's in non-discriminating hormone. It can cause growth in lots of different places and possibly where you don't want it. Okay. What's the stimulus today? I haven't gotten there. Sorry. You're ahead of me. Morgan, slaughter. Okay. Growth hormone is going to be controlled again by two hormones coming out of the hypothalamus. One of those hormones is cleverly called growth hormone releasing hormone. Guess what growth hormone releasing hormone does for a living? Okay, you get this one wrong on an exam, you're also in big doo doo. <laughs> Right. So this is number C, because we're listing now the hormones that come out of the hypothalamus. Growth hormone releasing hormones target is going to be the anterior pituitary. It's going to tell the anterior pituitary to release growth hormone. Shh. Well, we're going to separate you guys. These are also releasing or inhibiting hormones. And okay. remember? So okay. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Now, growth hormone, releasing hormone is usually, remember, here's a hormone, so what's we know its source, what's its stimulus, and the stimulus is a drop in blood nutrient levels. A drop in blood nutrient levels, the hypothalamus notices that, and he's going to send out growth hormone, releasing hormone, because look at what growth hormone going to do. It's going to increase your blood nutrient levels. It's a mechanism for making sure we have enough nutrients available for while we're growing, pre-puberty. The scary thing is there is also a hormone called growth hormone inhibiting. I can hear you guys. Growth hormone inhibiting hormone. Fourth hormone out of the hypothalamus. Growth hormone inhibiting hormone is going to do exactly what his name promises. He's going to go to the anterior pituitary and he's going to tell the anterior pituitary <coughs> to stop producing growth hormone. When would we want that? That's not going to be a growth hormone inhibiting. That's going to be an antagonistic action by the sex hormones. I'm serious. You start to stop growing once you hit puberty. But when we have, and I think we just, according to the wig, we just had a case right here in Cecil County. When we have a situation where there is very low blood nutrient levels, the hypothalamus is going to tell you instead, don't bother trying to grow. Don't bother trying to grow. Hmm? At this time, until nutrients come back. Yeah. Are you talking about the, the two little kids that we went to the yes. the Exactly. Right. You take your kid you take your kid to the doctor and they're gonna put it on a growth chart and an age chart and they're gonna say, Oh, okay. <coughs> Kid's a little fussy eater. Take them back again another time, look at the growth chart. Mm, kid's still not where we're supposed to be. Third time social services is usually called in. Okay? We must have missed it this time in Cecil County, but it is We've all heard horrible stories of children that have been found in the closet or the car trunk or something like that, and they weigh 30 pounds when they're supposed to be teenagers or something like that, just to exaggerate.
But that's exactly what's happening. Your body is keeping you alive by not asking you to grow at a time when you can't. It's a very interesting question that most people don't like to address because we always want to have a happy ending at the end of the story. But when we see, if you look in the news and you see the pictures of the kids in various countries that are in camps and are you know, just basically skin and bones type thing, the question is whether their neurological development has also been stumped and whether even if we can bring them back to the rest of their body, what kind of mental development has been delayed so and is it a permanent delay? We don't know. It depends on what age group. Sometimes they can, sometimes they do. And I don't know. It's really tricky to collect the data on that. I would think it would be really tricky unless you wanted to go to one of the concentration camp records which we decided we're not allowed to use in science research. One of, the, one of the agreements after World War II was that all of the horrible experiments that were done in the concentration camps, that data is not supposed to be being used. However, if you went to the concentration camps that were in Asia, some of the data has been used. So it's a real, it's, a, it's more of a gentleman's agreement within scientists. So, so wait, they, so they do have the data for the, for the, not for the uh, Nazi? Some cases, yeah. They have some data, like what they did with the twins, like all right. those things. Yeah. Right, we have, the, we have the data, it's just not supposed to be cited in your research report. Right. Okay. Um, That's mm -hmm. that question. So how come if there's no blood in trans, it releases a growth? Right, because that's just no, we're just trying to keep your body in balance, trying to keep enough nutrients in your bloodstream all the time. So if you skip a meal, yeah. right, kind of thing. So that's just to keep you growing in a constant method. Okay, so that's, so even if, that's normal. Even if you have low blood nutrients, you'll still get growth? Right, it has to be the extreme, that's why I put lots okay. of hours in there. And that's the that you get. Okay. Right. right. Yes, Morgan. Is that the only thing you would? Sounds good to me. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, growth hormone is a fairly simple protein molecule that we can synthesize. Uh, so it has led to the fact that now, like insulin, growth hormone is much more commercially available. It used to be 20 years ago that the only growth hormone we got was by taking cadavers and grinding up the pituitary glands and isolating the growth hormone. And we had enough for maybe 10 people uh, who had stunted growth. Nowadays, you can go to almost any pediatrician and they can pop you some growth hormone subscri right, prescriptions kind of thing. In fact, it's a, the uh, American Pediatric Association lists it as a medicine that is abused because people will go in and say, I don't want my little kid to be small, short like I was and we know it's traumatic and blah, 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 blah. And we all know that tall people are more considered more successful in life. So give my kid... I want my kid to grow. Yes, dear. Is it the same thing as a human growth hormone? Um, like human is just the growth hormone we find in humans. That's the same thing. So I know some athletes have like HGH. Right. So it's That's the, the same, same thing. thing. Right. As compared to taking a cow's growth hormone or a fish's growth and you hormone. You get that at like cost of Almost over the counter. Yes, you can. That's what I'm. That's why I'm warning you not to do it. <laughs> kind of thing. But the question is, it's been on the market now for a good number of years, so we have some data. And what's interesting is that when children have been given growth hormone supplements, only 50% of them respond at all. And in most cases, what happens is they simply grow to what they're genetically programmed to be, just faster. Which I can't think of anything more depressing than being in middle school and knowing this is it, <laughs> kind, of thing. Um, kind of thing. But it didn't make them taller than what the other genetic factors in their bodies are going to make them. But the question was, why didn't the other 50% show any reaction? And it turns out that growth hormone isn't the end of the story. When growth hormone goes to all body cells, what it really does, it stimulates another local hormone called insulin-like growth factor. So the growth hormone does that, and that's what in turn stimulates the cells. So the people who really were not growing was because they didn't have this factor, not the necessarily the growth hormone. 
Growth hormone might have been getting there, but without that extra hidden step, insulin-like growth factor. So the story and the action of growth hormone was a lot more complicated, is a lot more complicated, but it is still a problem that you will find if you work in a pediatrician's office that people will try to get the doctor to write a prescription so their kids will be tall and famous. No, we don't, I mean, the problem with local hormones, remember, is they're very short-lived and there's very small amounts. So I think it's much more difficult to isolate and, and fix that one. Are there some children who are heavier than you think you've seen to the doctor and, you know, the kids are the dose part, you know, the That's the key phrase right there. It's just an indication to say we have to look at something. So once we've answered the easy question, are you feeding them enough, then we start to look physiologically for other factors. If so, yeah? I'm sorry. If an hypothalamus makes the growth hormone releasing hormone, um, and does it send it to the anterior pituitary and that releases yes. it? No. The growth hormone releasing hormone is made by the hypothalamus. Right. And the growth hormone releasing hormone, so, is going to go to the anterior pituitary, and the anterior pituitary releases the hormone. Okay, hang on to the thought. So what I want you to see is a pattern here. If the hormone's name has releasing hormone or inhibiting hormone as part of it, it must be coming from the hypothalamus and it must be going to the anterior pituitary. So you already know three parts to the story. If I ask you where does growth hormone inhibiting hormone come from, it must come from the hypothalamus. What is its target is the anterior pituitary. Wait, that's going to hold true for like this whole time. Anything that says releasing hormone or inhibiting, if you look at your first night's notes, when we listed what comes out of the hypothalamus, I said releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones. If it's part of the name, it comes from the hypothalamus, and the only place it's going to go is the anterior pituitary. So there are two things. It's the growth hormone and the... So for both prolactin and for growth hormone, we have two hormones like a brake and a gas pedal. Right. But watch what happens next. Those are the only two. Prolactin, growth hormone, both have two hormones telling it what to do. But let's go to somebody else that we know. I didn't want to worry. So, so here's my hypothalamus. Let's go to number three in the anterior pituitary list. It's a hormone we know, TSH. Anybody remember TSH? Thyroid stimulating. There you go. <laughs> Thyroid stimulating hormone. Okay, two points. What's its target? Yay, team. target is going to be the thyroid gland. Now be careful because the thyroid produces two hormones. Which one is produced under the influence of TSH? Thyroxin. Okay. So here's the hormone TSH. His target is the thyroid gland and he's going to tell the thyroid gland to produce thyroxin. The hypothalamus. Remember the anterior pituitary can't do a thing on its own. In high school, you may have learned that it was the master gland. <laughs> the, hypo the anterior pituitary is just... Doing Absolutely. Anterior pituitary is going to be released, what do we have to, E? B, C, D, E. It's going to produce a hormone called thyrotropic releasing hormone known to his friends as TRH. And TRH, there's the releasing hormone in his name. So we know he comes from the hypothalamus, we know he goes to the anterior pituitary, and since he's a thyrotropin, he's turning on TSH. So the TRH turns on the TSH. TSH. And it's pretty simple. The hypothalamus is monitoring when there's a drop in thyroxine. 
when there's a drop in thyroxine, that means that normally speaking, we will always have a fairly constant level of thyroxine. As soon as there's a drop, the hypothalamus tells the anterior pituitary, tells the thyroid, make more. So sort of like the heating system in the house. A little bit of a drop and we're going to kick in a whole series of steps and bring the heat back up. Are we all good so far? Okay, now we have a problem. Well, it's not a problem. It's just like, well, the problem is I need a longer board. <laughs> because remember what thyroxine does. Thyroxine is a hormone that goes to all body cells and tells it to increase metabolic rate. It tells it to increase blood nutrients. So when, as we sit here, we have a fairly constant level of blood nutrients thanks to growth hormone. Well, not for most of you. <laughs> thanks to thyroxine levels. We're just going to keep it. As soon as there's a drop, thyroxine kicks in and we get more of it. Hey, what is all the thyroxine? See yesterday's notes. What happens if all of a sudden somebody comes, well, we won't talk about an elephant. Let's say somebody comes in with an Uzi. Let's say this place goes on fire. Let's say we are seriously wounded and our bodies need more than enough nutrients to repair, to recover. What happens if we have a stress situation, we're physiologically stressed, we are burned, we are wounded, we need more than this nice, normal amount of blood nutrients. What's gonna happen there is that the hypothalamus is going to say, scratch listening to thyroxine, he's going to listen to stress. Stress will tell the hypothalamus to increase TRH, which increases TSH, which brings up more thyroxine. We can, yes, there's, we can say thyroxine is a stress hormone because it can be stimulated the normal way or it can be overridden by a stress situation. Keeping that in mind, and notice that we only run thyrox th TSH with a gas pedal. There's no thyroxine inhibiting hormone. It's just more or less gas pedal. We go over to the fourth guy. Remember ACTH. Adrenocorticotropic hormone. So we're up to number four, coming out of the anterior pituitary, ACTH, which stands for adrenocorticotropic hormone. Remember to always read it backwards. It's a hormone that turns on the cortex of the adrenal gland. His target, adrenal cortex, his action is to produce cortisol. That's in yesterday's notes. When is the anterior pituitary going to produce ACTH? When he's told to. So we have a hormone, number F, coming out of the hypothalamus. And he's called corticotropic releasing hormone. Corticotropic releasing hormone. Immediately we know he comes out of the hypothalamus and he goes to the anterior pituitary. He's going to go to the anterior pituitary, tell it to release ACTH, ACTH, <coughs> excuse me, then goes down to the cortex and tells it to release cortisol. So normally as we sit here, again, the hypothalamus is simply listening and as soon as there's a drop in cortisol, the hypothalamus will send out CRH to bring our cortisol levels back up to normal. As we sit here, we should have a fairly constant thyroxine level, a fairly constant cortisol level, because as soon as there's a drop, the hypothalamus tells the anterior to be Let's remember cortisol again. Cortisol's job was also to go to all body cells, and it also increased blood nutrients. So you should be able to suspect what we're going to say next. As we sit here, your levels of cortisol are normal. Your blood, blood nutrient levels are normal. 
But if something should happen, and we are wounded, if we are burned, if we are sick with a fever, and your body needs more than the normal amount of nutrients to fix you, the hypothalamus is going to respond to fever. It's going to respond to a burn. It's going to respond to a wound. It's going to respond to stress. It's going to override the cortisol levels and say we need extra amounts of CRH so that we can get extra amounts of ACTH so we can get extra cortisol. Cortisol is our second stress hormone because cortisol kicks in when the body is stressed. Speaking of stress, we'll use purple for the ravens. <laughs> Those two hormones are called stress hormones because their control can be overridden in times of stress. It's very interesting and sort of depressing. I think, unfortunately, a lot of AMP stories are depressing. Kind of thing. I was at a conference one time, and the it's the guy was talking as an endocrinologist, and he was showing us a picture. He showed us a picture of something that looked like a bag of bones, a person that was kind of thing, lying on a table. And he said, what do you see? And we all said, oh, it's a cadaver. And he said, look more carefully. He said, that we don't usually put a pillow under the head of cadavers, kind of thing. And he said, this is a burn patient. 20, 30 years ago, the only thing we did for burn patients was to give them antibiotics to prevent infection and to replace their fluids because we know they were losing their fluids. What we didn't realize is that they also needed thousands more nutrients than a normal body because their body was repairing. So we lost burn patients long ago, not because of infection or dehydration. We lost them because we were starving them to death. We didn't give them. So nowadays, a burn patient is going to have three IVs, one for fluids, one for antibiotics, and the third one is simply going to be a nutrient drip. Kind of thing. And it's going to be a massive nutrient drip. Literally, the amount of nutrients a burn patient needs is thousands of times more than a person who's lying in down the hall just recovering from something normal. So, but stress, I think burns, but any kind of a wound, any kind of a fever where the body is being asked to replace and repair much more accelerated rate, we're going to have an override from the hypothalamus making sure that more thyroxine and more cortisol is out there simply because we know the body needs more nutrients to build and repair. Yeah. Do you get like CPU? No, that would be in a heart situation. Oh, okay. Tune into the next unit. <laughs> okay, so we've got four anterior pituitary. I promised us six. The last two are cheating. Five and six are going to be follicle stimulating hormone. FSH, and luteinizing hormone. Let's get rid of all this other stuff. The last two anterior pituitary hormones are the two hormones that we know. Their target is the gonads and the action is to increase the sex hormones. So another name for FSH and LH is gonadotropins. These two hormones, we're not going to specify any difference between them until we get to the reproductive system. So FSH and LH are called gonadotropins because their job is to go down to the gonads and trope them. Turn them on. Okay? FSH and LH. Again, anterior pituitary doesn't do a thing on its own. So what we have to do is have, and I've lost count, G? G. Okay. We have one hormone that controls both FSH and LH, and it is called gonadotropic. We can almost make it up at this point. Gonadotropic releasing <coughs> hormone. Okay. Now watch if you abbreviate. Because if that starts to look in H, it's something else. Right? Gonadotropic releasing hormone. 
is going to come out of the hypothalamus, is going to go to the anterior pituitary and tell it to release the gonadotropins. And we can pretty much guess when. Again, we're going to simplify male, female. We're going to put it together when there's a drop in sex hormones. And this is a true story for adult men. Females get more complicated. But we know males should keep a fairly constant level of testosterone. When it drops, the hypothalamus sends out GnRH. GnRH goes over to the anterior pituitary, tells it to release gonadotropins, and we increase our blood testosterone again. Okay, females are more complicated, but since we're only worried about endocrine right now, we're going to keep the story simple. Okay. So we've listed a whole bunch of hormones that come out of the hypothalamus, but they're easy because we know that their target and their action is has to go to the anterior pituitary, has to tell the anterior pituitary what it's going to do. Okay. Then we have six hormones coming out of the anterior pituitary, and we sort of know what they're going to do. Yeah? It's going to be a drop of the sex hormones, either testosterone or estrogen, depending on your persuasion. So, hormones coming out of the anterior pituitary. Humorally, hormonally, or morally stimulated. Has to all be hormonal because they're listening to releasing and inhibiting hormones. That's a pretty straightforward one. It's always a hormonal. Humoral is blood chemistry like glucose or calcium. Hormonal is a hormone that's telling it what to do, like TSH. Oh, in fact, let's do this for a second. Life can get a little complicated. We are pretty much finished with the formal, and we only have a little bit to talk about as far as informal or non-traditional hormones. A week from today, we got a quiz. A week from today, we're going to have a quiz. Later today is when we finish the and hormones. A week from today, we'll have a quiz. I'll post an example on Blackboard sooner or later, probably the weekend, weekends when I catch up on things. Um, but it's simply going to be a matter of if I list a gland, what hormone is produced, or if I list a gland, what stimulates, or if I list a hormone, what's the stimulus to produce this kind of thing. But, yeah? Are, are we um, male when we get in my I just said I was going to post something on Blackboard. I'm saying, are you just doing this three more times, or just doing it? It depends on whether I like you or not. <laughs> <laughs> Lose a game and you're out. You know, just for giving you a warning now. If you start losing games, I don't post any more information. So, for example, if I said, um, if I put on an exam cortisol. If I said uh, growth hormone, if I said insulin, okay? If I asked you, what's the source? You could fill those in, right? What do you mean by source? We've been saying it all along. instead if I do something like um, if I did oh we'll just leave it it like that. If I just give you, if I fill in one column, you should be able to fill out anything else. Right? Right? So one set of questions will be if I list glands, what hormones come out of them? One set of questions will be if I list the hormone, what's its action or target? It's just going to be short answer quizzes, quiz on all of the, all of the hormones that we are going to finish talking about. We'll do another example. We'll do a better example next time when I'm more prepared. But let's finish off the things we need to know. Okay. There are
there are several, stru many structures in the body that produce hormones that we don't think of as glands at all. One of them, so here's a group of non-traditional endocrine structures. And we need to know all about their hormones too. One is the heart. The heart is going to release a hormone called atrial natriuretic factor or peptide, I don't care which we call it, ANF or AMP. Okay. His target is going to be the kidneys. Natriuretic. And we're going to come back to it 